So, thank you, thank you very much for having me, bearing with me. Um, thanks for the introduction, Julia. So yeah, I was here around a month ago, and um, I just, I, I'm in town for a couple of weeks and wanted to take the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about, a little bit more, longer than five minutes, on my work on modeling food supply network structure in order to identify the source of large-scale outbreaks of foodborne disease. And um, this is work that I began in my PhD at MIT in the department that's now called the Institute for Data Systems and Society, and that I then moved to Germany to continue as a postdoc where I implemented the models and algorithms that I developed in the PhD at the German equivalent of the FDA, the Bundesinstitut für Risikoverwertung, the BFR, and um, working also with the Robert Koch Institute, the German equivalent of the CDC. And so the, the work that I'm going to be showing you today is based on those, the, those methods and then um, case studies that we conducted together with the BFR and the, the Robert Koch Institute. Um, so the, the people that I'd like to acknowledge, there's a, there's a lot of people that have been involved in this project. Um, most recently at the BFR, the, the, um, all my colleagues at the German equivalent of the FDA. And then my collaborators, my other collaborators in Germany, Hanno Friedrich and his PhD student Andreas Balster, who were responsible for developing the network model, the German food supply network model that I'll talk about and then my, my um, undergraduate intern at MIT, Elena Polzova. So, I will get started. And um, so, the, I like to motivate my talk um, by giving an example of one of the kinds of large-scale outbreaks that I look at. So, this helps us to see the, the scale of the, 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 the outbreak that I look at. So, I don't look at outbreaks that are a local kind of point source contamination, home kitchen, or catering facility, restaurant. I look at things that are spread throughout some kind of distribution large enough that it's involving a significant portion of the network structure of the food supply chain. And so the 2011 outbreak of E. coli and sprouts is a perfect case example of that. It was a huge outbreak. Um, there were, most of the cases were in Germany, but there were cases of illness, um, thousands of cases throughout all of Europe and even into North America. And despite this, this large distribution, um, I'm showing you here the incidence map of, of the cases just in Germany. And um, despite that large distribution in Germany and throughout Europe, it took investigators nine weeks to identify the source at this small organic farm circled in the, the, the region circled in red in the, the north of this map. And nine weeks to identify the source, what does, that, what does that actually mean? Well, if we look at the investigation timeline, we see that the outbreak was identified on it wasn't until over a month later that the Robert Koch Institute was able to confirm sprouts as the food vector source of this outbreak. And this is after almost everyone who had gotten sick had gotten sick. And it wasn't until two months later that the BFR was able to confirm this, this organic farm that I just showed you the red circle as the location source mm -hmm. of where these sprouts were produced. And so clearly there's this huge lag between awareness and identification, and that's what we want to be able to close, we want to close that gap. And so this, this kind of illustrates, this is my problem framing, we have three, when there's a foodborne disease outbreak, there are really three parts of the, the response process. There's identifying the outbreaks occurring, detecting the outbreak, there's identifying the food vector source of the outbreak, and then there's identifying the location of the source of the outbreak. And so I, um, the food vector sprouts the location source pulls in this, this kind of so these are the two parts of the problem that I'm focusing on um, and I'll be talking about today. And of course, how can we do this faster and more accurately using data that is currently available and developing improvements that can be contributed to the, um, the, the regulatory food safety investigation process. So um, just a little kind of toy example of, of, of what we're doing. So let's assume for a moment that we have perfect model of the aggregated food supply chain network consisting of multiple stages of production, processing, distribution, retailing or consumption, point of sale. When we have an outbreak, we get cases of illness that are reported, hopefully in association with specific location like retailer, restaurant, that food is purchased at. And then the, the job of the modeler is to develop a model that can identify the highest probability source, the second 
highest probability source, so on and so forth, till we develop a probability distribution of ordered ranking over all the possible sources of the algorithm. So I'm going to be talking about how we do that more specifically in the next in the next few slides. So, um, but first, taking a step back, we have to we have to have that underlying network structure. So that is one of the reasons that I went to Germany. Besides that, I wanted to implement this work so it could hopefully be used in real real outbreak response. Um, but also, this network model that my, my colleagues developed was available. And so the problem with modeling the food supply chain um, is that even if every single company has perfect RFID traceability data throughout their entire supply chain, what we don't have are the connections between companies. And food, the food industry operates at such the margin that any little competitive advantage they have, they, they don't want they want they don't want their competitors to know who they trade with, who their suppliers are. And so they don't share that cross company information. So we wanted so so we want to be able to develop some approach to model the whole supply chain without having that act exact data. So we take an aggregated approach. And so we've developed this um, the spatially and industrially aggregated model of the supply chain consisting of also the kind of aggregated stages that I showed you, production or, or agriculture processing, <coughs> trade distribution, and consumption. And it's spatially aggregated, this particular model in Germany, spatially aggregated into the 402 uh, Landkreisen counties of Germany, including 50, uh, in addition to 50 import and export countries. And um, it's also it's also aggregated into these stages of supply, and aggregated into the 51 commodity groups um, that encompass all of the food consumed in Germany. So you probably can't see these categories that that well, but um, some of but the the categories that we have are determined by the statistical data that was available for each food item. So one category is pretty pretty finely. Is, is, is pretty finely resolved eggs. Um, of course, there are many brands of eggs, but for our aggregated model, we have a, a network structure of eggs, and we know the amount of eggs that are produced in each of these Lundkreisen and consumed in each of the Lundkreisen. But for another category, uh, much more aggregated vegetables. Unfortunately, that's not that that's not that precise. But it's um, it's what we had to work with in the, the first you know network model uh, for Gen Zero. So that's our starting point. And um, so we it's it's a model. I've been saying it's a, it's a model. It's not a set of data. So the modeling process we start with inputs and, and outputs, the spatial production and consumption data in each of these long So I'm just showing you an example of production of sugar beets. And then that's transformed into production of sugar in different locations, production of confectionaries in different locations, and then the transportation and distribution of those confectionaries, and ultimate consumption. So we have that that stage supply, and then um, once we have those those production and consumption values form our nodes, and then we connect the nodes with links, obviously that we estimate using gravity modeling approach. And the key part of this gravity modeling approach is estimating this distance deterrence factor, which is done for each food product category depending on the, um, the, the locations, the, the distance that could be distributed throughout the, um, throughout the country, keeping in mind um, optimization principles as well as um, the, the production, the, pr the distribution according to population. So I'm not going to get into the detail exactly how that, that parameter is estimated, but um, there is the process that keeps all of that in mind. And then there's an additional step of calibration to this German Federal Transport Master Plan data, which is a survey of all transports between these lines in Germany. So we estimate these, these, these links, the volume that's transported along these links, and then we do this for all these food products, and we have this iterated of um, optimization problem to get it to match as closely as possible to this uh, federal uh, shipping data. So that's that's what I can say about the network model for now. So now if we have that network model, we can develop these methods to estimate the source of the outbreak given that network model. 
So first, identifying the location source. And I know I framed the problem a few slides back. The first step is, of course, well, the, after we know that there's an outbreak occurring, the first step is identifying the food vector. Uh, so the example I gave sprouts. And the second step is identifying the location source. But I'm going to talk through this method first because it actually underlies our approach to identify the food vector source. So um, I showed you this in a toy model to formalize that um, the network source localization problem is uh, we assume we have this network model, like for example the one I just showed, and a probabilistic model of the transmission process, which of course is a model that we develop. And um, our outbreak process, at some starting time, we have a single source. We assume that there's a single source. And all other nodes in the network are susceptible. The contamination spreads through the network, resulting in these cases of illness reported at a subset of network nodes. And our objective is to estimate the source location given that network model and our observations of illness and our model of the transmission process. And so there, this is not a new problem. There have been a number of different researchers who have studied the network source identification pro, uh, problem in different problem contexts, assuming different problem constraints. And in our paper, we review these different, we review these various methods and conclude that the majority of them cannot actually be applied in the context of the foodborne disease problem. And the reason for that is because there are distinguishing features of foodborne disease transmission that make it different than a lot of these other problems. And so to review some of them, um, one, one major one is that food is really transported through the food supply chain. So this is really a transport diffusion process much more than an epidemiological contagion reaction process. And so methods that have um, assumed an SI, SIR process are adding a lot more complexity to this problem than we actually, than we actually see um, when we have food that's transported through the supply chain. Um, even if it's not packaged, still the contamination is not large, is largely not growing extensively throughout the supply chain. Um, second, we have the fact that observations are sparse. So most, most nodes are not observable. We're actually only observing illness in connection to the, the point of the last point of sale. Um, we don't have sampling throughout the supply chain. And um, so there are a lot of methods that assume complete observations of all nodes in the network that's not feasible in this problem. Um, and also for that same reason that we only observe the contamination that last point, um, we, we have observations far from the source because it goes, the source was normally early in the supply chain, early enough that it's able to reach this wide distribution throughout the network. And so that means it's a number of steps removed from the point of sale of where we observe it. Um, we also have the fact that most path links through the supply chain, because food has to go through these various stages, path links are similar. So methods that assume, let's look at only the, the shortest path tree through the network. This is not going to work when most paths through the network are the same number of steps, or more or less the same number of steps. And for the same reason, methods that look at only the highest probability source don't apply as well because we have multiple candidate paths through the network of similar probability. And um, that's because the food, food supply chain, there, aren't, there isn't a large monopoly. There are a large number of competing retailers or wholesalers, each sharing similar market shares. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have to consider all of the possible paths that it could have traveled. So to just dig into that with an example from our network model, um, when we, so now I'm showing you again the E outbreak. Um, there's a, a large cluster of illnesses in this location called Powderborn, uh, this county called Powderborn. And if we look at the, the top 10 probability paths from pools in the source to Powderborn, there is one that is much higher probability than the other, about double the second highest probability source uh, path. Um, and that's because this is a shorter, shorter distance and there's really this one designated path. But when we look at another uh, destination, for, for example, this is Frankfurt here, um, there are, and we look at the top 10 probability paths from Bolton to Frankfurt, it's a larger distance, and there are, all, all of these, the, these paths are much similar, closer, distributed probability. So we don't want to just look at the highest probability path, we would um, kind of be doing that at random. And so, there, so, so yeah, that's why we want to consider multiple paths. And so of all the methods that we reviewed, there's really only one that we concluded is, is implementable in our problem, 
in the foodborne disease problem and that's the effective distance approach, uh, the Brockman and Helbing or Dirk and Dirk um, approach. And um, this, this uh, approach for identifying the source of an outbreak, uh, in, to simplify it, essentially looks for the shortest, highest probability path tree through the network from every single source, um, every single feasible source. And looks at the, so the shortest, highest probability path to each location where the contamination has been observed. And so that is one approach that works for that works for a lot of, that works for some of the um, large scale the, the the global mobility the airline network where you might have paths that are much more um, heterogeneous in their probabilities, but it doesn't work as well in the foodborne disease problem for the reasons that I just been talking about. And so to deal with that, we developed uh, or to address this this gap, we had, we developed a random walk contamination transmission model. And so the, the, this allows us to consider all paths of all probabilities throughout the network. Um, it's actually an absorbing random walk because we have food exiting the supply chain at that point of sale, never to re-enter again. So an absorbing random walk where the transition probabilities are defined in terms of the relative outgoing weights along this network. Um, and so once we have that, that transmission model, we can turn this into an inference, a Bayesian inference problem. I say maximum likelihood, but it's, I guess, maximum a posteriori probability. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually two, we have a two-step problem. Our first step is to use network structure to filter the, the number of um, possible source nodes down to those that share a link through the network to all contaminated nodes. Um, and then, Based on that set of feasible sources, we determine the probability that any feasible source is the true source, given our observation set of illnesses data. And so we have Bayesian inference, which is the probability of the source given the observations, the probability, the prior probability of the source times the probability of the observations given the source, which comes directly from our transmission model. And so we have this nice maximum likelihood or maximum a posteriority probability um, estimator. And um, with the with the random walk transmission prop um, model, we get this nice kind of closed form expression for the maximum likelihood estimate for the source. And again, I know the thing again, but the the contribution here is that we are able to account for all possible paths of travel through the network. And so. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through this toy example. It's in our paper, but it's just a simple example to show the value of considering multiple paths. If we only look at the highest probability path through the network, we don't get the same result as if we look through all the paths. Kind of maybe too obvious to show. So okay, I'll show now. I'm going to show it evaluated um, first on stylized networks, just to make a, a, a just to make a, a small point there, and then on the Germany network and um, the EHERCUS data. So the, the outbreak that I was showing. So stylized networks. So um, I'm showing two, two very stylized models. One when, where we have very heterogeneous path probabilities through so the network here. The, the path probabilities are, the, the, the links are weighted according to the probabilities. And on the right, we have this homogeneous network where each link is exactly the same probability as any other link. And when we evaluate this method in comparison, so our, our method in comparison to the effective distance measure, which looks at the single highest, uh, shortest highest probability path to each observation, and a network baseline, which essentially just identifies that set of feasible nodes and, and chooses at random between them, doesn't involve any probability, just as a baseline for what are the possible sources in this problem to compare to that. Um, we're, we're, we're able to do uh, better than the effective distance measure by considering all possible combinations of paths, even for this heterogeneous network where um, some paths are much higher probability than others. But of course, when we look at the homogeneous network where all paths share the same probability, we're able, the, the effective distance measure can't compete because it's essentially choosing at random between all of these equal probability paths. So, so just that was the small point I wanted to make. Now we can look at the real data, and when we compare to the, when we evaluate, we're able to identify the source location that the county, by our, our network model, 
the county the network was using the vegetable network. So this is the closest network match that we have to Sprouts. Um, so using the vegetable network, at spatially aggregated, we're able to identify the county pulls in by the data based on week two of the outbreak. And um, when we compare to the effective distance measure, we're able to do this with a little bit, with, with more, um, uh, more consistently throughout the course of the outbreak. And we can see that the probability distribution on the map, we can see it um, converging on the source as the data increases and the outbreak continues. So, um, so now that we have that in mind, we'll take actually a step back to the methods for identifying the food vector source in the outbreak. And um, so the, the, this is the question of which food network, which food item, which we have, for which we have network, combined with our transmission model of where we expect food to flow and therefore we expect to see cases, um, best supports or, or resonates the most with where we actually see the cases of illness observed. And so, so I'm showing you a skylight picture here. We have different networks for these different food items. And so we want to see which one best supports the observation data given our assumed model of the transmission process. And so we kind of call this a signal detection problem. Which, which network do we see the highest signal? And so the reason that I, I'm showing this after I showed the location <coughs> problem is because we quantify the resonance between the transmission model and where we actually see the cases by looking at the output from the probability distribution over the sources. So to break that down, for each food item network, we first we apply the, the source identification model that I just showed, that I just talked about, the location algorithm. And um, we develop a probability distribution of the sources. So this is um, the probability distribution resulting from applying the algorithm to the, the EVAC case data, the 2011 outbreak. And this is what we want to see. By the way, this is, this, this is the probability. And these are the source IDs sorted by ID number. So it doesn't really matter what order these are. But what we want to see is what we see here, where there are some really high probability locations and lots, many more very low probability locations. And so um, we, that's, that's structure, that, that's signifying resonance between a single source assumption mm -hmm. and the transmission model and where we see cases. And so um, to quantify that, we, we rank order the probability distribution. And um, we look at this curve, and we actually compare it to a uniform distribution. So if these are both distributions that are representing some ordering of the probability over the sources, then the uniform distribution represents a probability distribution over sources where each source is equally as likely as every other source. So essentially, no information. So we want to see how much more information our distribution from the case data is than no information. And we do that through a very simple metric, the um, mean absolute error, the difference between those two. We actually tried a large number of different metrics here, entropy, Kublak, Liebler, um, divergence. And the, the simple one gave us, um, was, was the most um, stable. Um, and so we do this for, so I was showing you in the red, in these previous slides, that you have case data on the vegetable network. But we do this for each um, possible network hypothesized uh, food item category of, of that could have been the source of the outbreak. And so this, what I'm showing you in blue, is that for the, the we have case data on the egg network. So it's a much less steep distribution. And so we would say that it has lower resonance between our transmission model and the single source assumption and the cases. And we do this, um, this is not the EHEC data, I'm going to save that for another slide, but this is just an illustrative example where I simulated an outbreak and we're seeing now the signal of all of these different food item networks. Um, each of these, these pictures, like the one I was just showing, it was at a slice in time, the probability distribution at a slice in time at 500 illnesses. Now I'm showing you the full range of the function of the number of illnesses from zero to a thousand. And so I want to just take a step back. I was just showing you what these signals are. Um, but what does a signal versus no signal look like? So here I'm showing you actually the, the outbreak that I simulated. 
um, that gave rise to the picture I showed on the previous slide. So this is an outbreak where there's a single source, um, and there then there's some distribution throughout the the, com the country based on um, based on the um, based on the network model. So it's just just for the just to see what a good signal would look like. And then on the right, I'm showing you a distribution where um, there's no there's no necessarily true source. I just sampled cases according to population. And when we look at the signals that emerge from these two outbreaks, we see on the left for the simulated outbreak, we do see this signal. And on the right, we see this um, plot for the signal. So we, this is kind of, this is definitely what we want to see, where when there is some, the, some structure in the distribution, we see that there's some structure in the signal. And on the right, um, when there's no structure in the data, we, we see no, no, no structure in the signal. Um, and so when we look now back at the, the 2011 EHAC data, um, we are able to see a signal here for the, the vegetable network, um, a stronger signal than the, than the other networks that, that we considered as possible outbreak sources. So this is work that I, I'm currently writing up right now. So. Um, and then if we, I just, yeah, so if you see this kind of peak at the beginning of the outbreak, if we zoom in on that, that was, uh, there's, a, there's a strongest signal at the very beginning of the outbreak when the cases were actually more, um, uh, the outbreak started in the north of Germany and the cases were more, um, co there's a spatial coherence in the north of Germany at the very beginning of the outbreak. So you, you see that even stronger signal at the very beginning, but it still doesn't fade, it fades out, but we can still detect that now. So now another case study that has a different distribution. So, um, so yeah, this was a this was uh, an outbreak in Styria, and this German product Vamo um, port. It's a pork belly product, and um, the at the the Robert Koch Institute they wanted us to look at this outbreak because um, when they were investigating it, there were a large number of possible food item category or food items and food item categories that we, they were considering, and it was actually this was a much longer ongoing outbreak, so three and a half years, and a much smaller distribution, 77 cases. And so the throughout throughout this time, investigators were trying to identify what was the product through the standard epidemiological analysis that is conducted um, interviewing patients on the foods that they ate and trying to find uh, the statistical um, overlap and high, likely a source based on that. There was there were a large number of products that all these people were consuming and they weren't able to narrow it down based on that. So we wanted to see if we could, using these aggregated methods, still narrow it down to one of these, these categories, right? I have these categories, so vegetables, I have a few different meat categories, and in, within dairy, I actually have a milk network, a milk products, and a milk products um, network, and, and, a, and a cheese network. And so this was the question, could we identify the, the network, the commodity group between these? And, and another difference between this, this outbreak and the EHAC outbreak is that um, I'm showing you the incidents here, also here in a different form. Um, this is just, um, this, here, here we have each dot represents um, cases per 100,000 people. And um, it's, it's, there are cases throughout Germany, but not nearly as far, it's, there's, a, there's a more of a, there's more of a um, aggregation uh, local aggregation than the EHEC outbreak, so it's another like a different kind of case study in terms of that the spatial distribution of the outbreak. Um, and so, okay, I'm also showing you here the probability distribution over the sources in blue. And so we're actually I'm I'm showing you this, but we're not able to do that well here. Actually, we're we're these probabilities are all extremely extremely close. Um, we're in the general region, but we, we're not able to say anything definitively where the source would be. So um, our network model isn't great for this particular problem for identifying the location source of the outbreak. And um, uh, you know, one of the, the reasons for this is that this, this VAMO product goes through actually multiple stages of processing, and that's not included in our network model. We just have this one stage of processing. So, 
Um, but when we look at the, even though it's not the perfect network model, when we take a step back and look at the the source, the the source vector, the food source of the outbreak, we are able to identify this um, this meat, this process the import product network as the the likeliest um, possible outbreak. And and when I when I when we talk about this with the the Robert Koch Institute, what they said was most interesting is actually the fact that. Um, that milk and cheese are down here at the bottom, um, and listeria is often involved with, with cheese and other kinds of dairy. So actually, that negative information is, is really is really useful for investigators. So so this is so this is what I'm going to show in terms of our case studies. We're, there's a couple there's a couple other outbreaks that are going to be in the paper that we're currently working on, um, but these are two different cases that that have these different um, factors that I wanted to, to talk through. And so to kind of wrap this up and, and say like what, what we've been able to see here, so um, we have, we've developed this, this set of methods to model the system level structure of the food supply, uh, food supply chain, getting around, you know, a way to get around the fact that we're, we don't have this exact supply chain data. And even as traceability improves and we get this better and better electronic traceability data, it's still going to be a really long time before we have this fully traceable supply chain across all companies. And so our, our, our method into this data is to model it using publicly available data in the spatially and industrially aggregated form. And um, I also talked about how food networks are structurally unique. And they, they, the food networks and food distribution outbreak, the way that it, it spreads and is transmitted, um, it lends itself to different features than a lot of the other standard epidemic problems that a lot of the network source identification methods have been developed for. So it's important to keep these in mind when addressing this problem. Um, I've definitely I've tried to yeah caveat how our model is it's it's very much a model it's aggregated it's estimated um, and it's it's not perfect and as we saw in the Listeria case study it you may not be um, granular enough to be able to, or represented en enough to identify the location source of the outbreak. But because the signal detection problem requires, um, it requires a signal, it requires some resonance between this transmission model and the observation of cases instead of this perfect um, granular identification of the source. And because of that, we, because it requires the bar is a little bit lower, we believe it's really the, the best use case of these methods currently. And that our case studies have suggested that it's sufficient to help with identifying the food vector source of the outbreak. And I should mention that this is actually, so I showed these two case studies. There are a couple other case studies that are going to be in our paper. But this is actually being used um, by at the, the, the BFR, the Bundes Institute, to um, help investigators during outbreaks, so not to say this is definitely the true source of an outbreak, but really their, their main use at the current, at, in, in the current time is to use it to prioritize which directions to look at. And if there are 10 different food items that are being considered for this being the source of an outbreak, that means there are these 10 different um, products that they have to sample and develop isolates for, and all of that takes a, a huge amount of time. And so this can help them to prioritize, okay, well, it's much likelier these kind of processed meat products. So let's start there, take those samples, and go from there. So still an iterative approach. And investigators have de described it as kind of a triangulation between these different pieces of information, the epidemiological investigation that comes in, um, if there's genome sequencing data that comes in, and then these kind of aggregated spatial um, food chain approaches that can all be combined together in helping investigators to identify the source. And yes, like I was saying, we sh I showed these different case studies with different outbreak features, um, one with a more localized cluster, one with a fully uh, national distribution, and we're able to see good results for the food vector identification for both of those. That's promising. Um, so of course, the next step, the very important next step, is to really develop through a, a thorough training and evaluation study um, uh, confidence 
estimates for the accuracy of this method at, in identifying the source of outbreaks. And so our approach to do this is, is you know, a couple different approaches. Of course, keep keeping on looking at true outbreaks that have occurred, um, and then also simulating outbreaks using an independent data source. So we don't want to simulate outbreak assuming our network model, because our network model is not the truth. We need to actually test that in combination with the source identification methods. Um, and so we're are, are, are we're actually doing this right now using um, product. Uh, highly resolved um, purchased product uh, retail sales data. So we have uh, for a large number of products the exact amounts that were sold at retail locations um, by zip code throughout Germany. And we can use this, we can sample from this to create an outbreak, a more representative outbreak distribution and use this to simulate outbreaks that we can use to evaluate the method accuracy. And then we're also um, testing this out in different contexts. So I was just at Public Health England last week, and we're going to be, um, they're going to be developing some, some case data. Some They have actually collaborations with retailers that can share some actual supply chain data that we're going to be using to test this out on. And then there's a paper that um, I've written with a colleague, mm -hmm. Xin Liu, who's, um, who is at the Chinese Center for Disease Control. And so we looked at this, these methods evaluated on pork supply chain networks um, with data that they have in China that we, we probably won't have in other countries. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a nice test case. Um, and then, of course, further developing the network model. Um, so one big point and, um, is that we, in the current network model, we don't allow for, for travel um, be, from the point of sale location to where people live, and people will shop outside of the location where they live, and they will also travel. So to account for that, we're, we're trying to integrate, this is called the last mile of the food supply chain, going from point of sale to where the person lives. So we're trying to better model that by um, doing some Huff gravity model approaches, and um, um, actually, I saw some work uh, a month ago using from, from Sandy Pentland's lab using credit card transaction data to validate Huff's model for, um, the, for the point of sale um, retail. And Huff's, Huff's gravity model is um, connecting consumers with the locations that they would go to purchase food um, based on a couple different assumptions about the, the, the retailer and the distance between them. Um, we're also looking to integrate novel, higher precision data sources and then implement these methods um, in the US. So uh, I won't go through all this in detail, but this is work that I'm going to be looking to be doing in the next in the next year. So we have this network for Germany. I'm coming back to the US, and I would I would like to do this in the US. And so um, looking for the right kind of collaborators. I'm going to be speaking with F with the USDA next week, hopefully developing some collaborations there because they would have they would have data that can only be shared. So facility location and volume data, um, which would be really help the granularity of the model if we actually have facility locations. Uh, but this is data that can only be shared through a, a collaboration. Um, and so and also the U.S. has uh, much better records on import and export data than Germany does, and so it will be. That would be a helpful data source to include, um, as long as, as well as integrating um, this retail consumption product sales data. And so, um, I. How what time is it? Should I? This yeah, is, you have seven minutes. Like I'm saying that there are if someone wants to ask questions and things like that. Yeah, so. I think it's. I'll stop here. This is future directions mm -hmm. that this work can go in. Um, that you know, not stuff that I'm currently working on. So mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I won't mm -hmm. talk about it. In, in I won't talk about it right now. So we can go to go to questions. Okay, question. One. Can you go back to the to the case of the pork belly in Germany, where yeah. you have that strength of the signal cube? Yeah. So this is great. It's and I, 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 I see the video. You know, of having the negative results and the positive results. Now, I, I, 
because of my experience in communicating with public health, etc. So how do you communicate those results in, in the context of public health? Because the strength of signal is an absolute number. So can you associate any probability to those thing or not? In a sense, you know, if I would be in the decision making process, I would say, okay, there is a prioritization, but I would like to associate the probability you know, a likelihood to, to the red cure, but a likelihood to the green cure, but perhaps a likelihood to the yellow food cure. But just saying this on a scale, it's, it's so what? Uh, can you do something like that? Or Yeah, yeah, no, uh, very good question. And when I presented this at the Robert Koch Institute for the first time, that, that exact question led to a two hour discussion. So, yeah, um, th they want to have some metric that they can use and that they can have some confidence in. And so, um, you know, I'm not showing, there's a, a kind of a two-part answer. So one thing I'm not showing here is we, we have these, um, these confidence bounds around each of these curves that are do that, that, that are um, developed from looking at um, comparing this distribution. So there's one part about this method that I actually did uh, that I didn't communicate, which is there's a normalization to each network structure. So each network structure has its own characteristic signal strength because of its own just uh, connectivity structure properties. And so you need to do this normalization. And the way we do that is we look at the PMF from the outbreak distribution, like mm -hmm. I, I showed, and then we also look at a PMF that comes from a just a, a random sample of cases. Um, where there wasn't, there wasn't a, a true source. And we do that for the network structure, and we do that you know, uh, thousands of times, and develop this distribution of what a kind of non-signal looks like for that network structure. And then we can say how much stronger the outbreak case data is than this, this confidence band of um, possible random fluctuations that you would see. That, is not communicable, right? Um, really, what and and, and so it's it's, it's almost um, we made a decision not to show that in this picture when we're communicating this to investigators because it actually almost lends a false security in the results because it's it's giving us a confidence in the fact that this is a signal and not due to random fluctuations due to the network structure. But what it's not telling us is the confidence that this method combined with the network model actually is accurate. And the way that we would get that um, is through an, a large evaluation study. And so that, I think, is the only way that we can actually provide that confidence for, it, for investigators. Um, that is why this next step that we're working on is this, this detailed, this uh, thorough evaluation study using simulated outbreaks which is the best that we can get to have a large, um, a large test case of outbreaks to compare this against. So that's, that's kind of what we're saying for now. Um, another thing that they were asking about too is like, what, is, what does the signal strength mean? I have this, this axis here, this signal strength of two. What does that actually represent? Is there an upper bound and a lower bound? A lower bound is a, around zero, but as we see, it's a little bit lower. Um, due to the way that our, our measure is defined. And so really we're, we're, we need to do a lot more evaluation studies to determine what these upper and lower bounds are because they're not defined by the methodology itself. So in a, to sum it all up, it's work in progress and we really, we, I, I, I'm so glad I worked with investigators for the last two years and really understand the importance of having this metric this defined metric that they can use, that they can understand, and that they can trust, and this is where their research will go, but this is kind of, this is in, in progress. So. Other questions? Okay. So I have two different